all of you welcome to this complex velocity module building workshop for using the xworks software in this uh, workshop we would be quickly discussing uh, the velocity and how to develop the velocity model for most of uh, other applications so this would be our agenda a quick review of velocity then calibration of velocity that is seismic velocity is calibrated with the well velocity then our workflow for designing or developing a velocity model and you would also see using the velocity model if we convolve it with a wicker wavelet or some wavelet we should get a synthetic seismic section which should be somehow equivalent or resemble similar to the interpretation that we have done on the seismic data now using the xwork software we would be discussing how to simply input the data then develop the velocity model then do the 2d forward modeling and then we would see what is integrated time depth feature and uh, we would also see how we can do quickly the time to depth conversion so this is a quick review of uh, seismic velocity we know that the contrast for seismic is velocity in fact seismic is the most important parameter in seismic and it is a very complicated parameter because unlike other geophysical parameters like resistivity density seismic velocities are of a number of types like in processing we have rms velocities then we can convert them into interval velocities we have average velocities and similarly we can have instantaneous velocity so we have to take care which type of velocity we are using for that specific purpose similarly there are a number of applications of seismic velocities in various areas like in processing in nmo corrections we also use velocities then in migration we also use velocities in time to depth conversion we use velocities and finally if you want to make a rock physics model so we would have more accurate interval velocities that can be further used to compute other parameters like the elastic parameters of rocks and even different pressure regime like our burden stress vertical effective stress and even pore pressure and fracture gradient here we would be talking about calibration of velocities we know the two main sources of velocities are either well velocities or seismic velocities if we talk about well velocities they are more accurate but their problem is that they are just 1d that is along the well bore it is just 1d with depth that is we have a velocity variation with depth for different formations but we know that velocity varies vertically as well as laterally so well velocities would be giving us good control at the well point but as we would be moving away from the well the velocity control would be deviating if you have multiple wells then we could have a better control on the other hand the seismic velocities they are dispersed throughout the seismic survey area but the problem is that the seismic velocities are not that accurate because when we do velocity analysis in seismic processing there is some 10% plus minus error in those rms velocities so we need to calibrate these velocities so the best thing is that we can use the good things from both the velocities that is we can use the seismic velocities and we can calibrate them using the well velocity so here we can see we have a simply a sonic log as a function of depth we have applied a moving average and so we got an average function of that which is shown in the pink color that is means high frequencies have been given then using the velocities within the sonic log we have converted it into the time domain and then using the log information you can see we have computed the block average of velocity for each interval like you can see this orange line which is a block average for that ecological or rock unit this orange curve is showing the interval velocities that is average velocity for each layer so now once we have these interval velocities for each of these intervals we can now convert them into average velocities so here this green curve is basically the average velocity derived from this well and now using seismic velocity function for the nearby cdp we can get that function which is this red function and now we can calibrate it and the calibration is simply we generate a calibration curve which is simply the ratio of uh, the velocity average velocity from the sonic divided by the average velocity from the seismic function so it means you can say certain percentage 
at some location well velocity is higher and at some places the seismic velocity is higher so it means through this ratio it will be computing how much percentage the seismic velocity is higher or lower and we finally get this calibration curve so it has a value around 1 1 means both the velocities are same if it is 0.99 or lower than 1 it means seismic velocities are higher so which means we have to multiply them with a lower factor less than 1 to scale them down and if the value is greater than 1 like in this case 1.09 it means seismic velocities are lower and we have to scale them up to match with the well velocities so once we have this velocity calibration curve we can multiply all the velocity functions to scale them up to the well velocity in case we have a number of wells then we can generate multiple calibration curves we can grid them and at each location or CDP location we will be having these calibration curves and we would be multiplying them with the velocity functions derived from seismic velocity analysis and so our velocities will be calibrated. So now this is the overall workflow for velocity model building that we would be using. So here you can see we have two major inputs. One is the seismic velocity. So you can see along the 2D seismic section, we have the raw RMS velocity that have been derived from velocity analysis that is picking the velocity functions. And on the other hand, we have the borehole velocity such as can be a VSP or a sonic log. So we convert first of all the well velocities into a domain that is we have to match apple with apple. So it means as I said that velocities are of several types. So our seismic velocities are basically RMS velocities. Whereas here, if I talk about sonic velocity, so it is for a very small interval. So technically it is uh, an instantaneous velocity. But when we block average it for a box unit, then it would be the interval velocity, that is the average velocity for that box unit. So after that averaging, which I showed in the previous slide, it means we got an interval velocity function and then we converted it into average velocity function. And similarly, the RMS velocity that we have picked here, we would also convert them into average velocity. And finally, the seismic velocities are also in the form of average velocity and the well velocity is also in the form of average velocity. And then we would calculate the calibration curve, which is simply the ratio of the well velocity divided by the sonic velocity. And then we will multiply all the velocity functions with that calibration curve. In the next stage, we will apply spatio-temporal interpolation. Spatial means space. That is, velocity analysis have been carried out after intervals, maybe 50 CDP intervals or maybe looking at the geologic structure, we have done velocity analysis. So we need to interpolate velocities at every CDP or every 10th or 5th CDP. So we have to interpolate the velocity functions in the lateral space. And temporal means time because the vertical component of seismic is time. So we also have to interpolate the velocity vertically. So at the end, we would have a matrix of velocities. That is, suppose if we have given the CDP interval of 10 CDPs and the vertical interval of 200 milliseconds, so we would have velocity functions after every 10 CDP and each of these functions would have samples, that is velocity time pairs after every 200 milliseconds. So we generate a grid of velocity. The main reason for creating this grid is because we need to apply smoothing to it because our velocities may have certain artifacts, some kinks, some sharp velocity. So we would apply a two-dimensional moving average for smoothing the velocity. It can be a 3 into 3 operator, 5 into 5, and 7 into 7, and so on. The more the order is increasing, it means it would act as a high cut filter. So we would smooth out these velocities, and after that, we would input our seismic interpretation, which is marking of the horizons and faults. And now based on these horizons and faults, the velocity functions that we have previously gridded, they would be interpolated according to the horizons and faults. And so that would be our horizon-based interpolated velocity function. And now if we can choose them, we would get an interval velocity-based velocity model, as you can see at the bottom. So that would be a real velocity model. When we say more realistic velocity model, what it means that the velocity is changing according to the geologic structure, that is the way the geological structures are changing or their thickness is changing. So similarly, the velocity also shows the same pattern. So in other words, you can say this is the subsurface image in terms of velocity field. 
So that would be our true velocity field and that we can use in a number of applications. Even advanced applications like post-act depth migration, they also need a velocity model which is developed in a similar fashion. I talked about 2D, but if we have a 3D seismic data, so the same procedure would be applied that we would have the well velocities, we would do the calibration, then we would have temporal interpolation, and we can also do gridding. But this time the gridding would be done not in 2D, but in 3D space. And similarly, the moving average that previously we applied an N into N operator. So in this case, we would be applying a three-dimensional operator that is three into three into three. That is in three dimensions, the operator would be moving. At the end of this, we would finally get, instead of a 2D velocity section, we would get a 3D velocity cube. And that would be applicable to the 3D sizing method. Finally, this is regarding the forward velocity model. You have seen here, we have interpreted horizons and faults derived from seismic interpretation, and we can also see the velocity function. These are the raw velocity functions, that is RMS velocity. So on one end, we applied the special temporal interpolation. And we can see the velocity functions here. So this is also a velocity field, but it is not according to the geologic structure. On the other hand, we have applied the horizon velocity interpolation, the velocity has been interpolated according to the geologic structure. So in both ends, we have the velocity function. Now, if you want to see which model is accurate or which is more realistic, so we would now convolve these velocity functions with a wavelet to generate a synthetic seismic section. So in this case, after 2D forward modeling, you can see a synthetic section which simply has straight horizons that is it is based on like i said 200 milliseconds interval a synthetic section which simply has reflectors after every 200 millisecond this is due to the fact that the velocity functions have been interpolated after every 200 milliseconds this synthetic seismic section nowhere represents the true geological situation but on the other hand this horizon interpolated velocities have generated a 2d forward model of seismic here you can see the structural information and that would be more matching with the real geology. From this what we conclude that if you have a true velocity model, if you convolve it with a wavelet, it would give us a more realistic subsurface geologic information as compared to another velocity model which doesn't include the subsurface geologic information. Here we have shown the time to depth conversion. So this was an interpreted seismic section in time domain. Here we have shown that if we apply the raw velocity function and apply them for depth conversions and you can see a lot of things here and that doesn't appear to be geologically true. But once we make a true processed velocity model and when we apply this to time to depth conversion, so you can see now the depth converted section is more smooth and geologically realistic. So that is the most important thing that when we have a more accurate velocity model, so when we use it in depth conversion, we would get a more geologically realistic depth section. Whereas if we use the raw velocity, they would not be giving us a true geologic picture in the depth domain.